And I believe that when this message is over, that we will begin to see that Satan never quits roaring, but there's a greater roar than the roar of Satan. And I'm going to introduce you to that today. So I'm going to ask you to stand in reverence of reading God's Word this morning. And uh, we'll be in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse uh, 8. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for Jesus Christ and what he did. He died on the cross that we could have eternal life. And while he was on the cross, he shed his blood to cover every sin that's on this world. And Father, he didn't quit until every one of them was covered. And they took down his, his humble body, all wretch with pain and anguish and, and the life drained out of him. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. And Father, as He promised, on the third day you rode that stone away. And Jesus walked forth, giving us victory over death, giving us victory over Satan. And Father, I can't praise you enough for that. But as we sung earlier, Father, I just want to thank you for the blessings that you flow on me, on this church, on each of us. Father, I cannot even count all the blessings. But the greatest blessing I have is be able to say, I am a child of the living God, Jehovah. Thank you for that promise, Father. I pray everyone here today, everyone hearing my voice, will be able to say, I am a child of God. And with that promise, there is nothing that Satan can bring forth that my God can't handle. Because God said in His Word, Greater is He that is in me than he that's in this world. And Father, I praise You that You gave us the book to read. And as we read it, Father, when we got to the end... You gave us another great blessing that you're going to take Satan and all of his demons and you're going to cast them into the pits of hell for the final time and seal it up that there will be no more sin. But Father, until that time, let us faithfully work because as Jesus told the disciples as he was at the well with the Samaritan woman, as the people were coming from Samaria towards him, he said, look, the field is white ready for harvest. And Father, that is our job, is to bring in the harvest, to build your kingdom through your Son, giving you the glory and the praise. And today, Father, I ask you to speak through this humble servant of yours, that you will guide us and direct us where you'd have us be. May my question not be today. May my request not be this way, Lord. What what can you give me? But Lord, what can we do for you? Give us that. Show us. And Father, may our faith grow enough that our obedience will do as you've asked. Father, I ask if there's anyone that doesn't know Jesus Christ today, that today would be their day of salvation. If they have never made a a following of yours through baptism, I pray they come today. If they never joined a church, I pray they join a church. And I recommend this church, a, a Bible teaching, faith believing, believing that Jesus is coming back, church. And Father, we're going to give you glory and praise because we know you have good news for us today. We came expecting, and you're going to deliver. For we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. All right, I told you verse 8. Well, I'm going to fib a little bit. We're going to go to verse 6. I have a little more to read here this morning. It says, Humble yourselves unto the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. I could stop right there. But he goes on. He says, Cast all of your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. 
And then he goes on. Listen to this verse. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But Peter writes, resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Nothing going on in your life is any different than someone else in the world. We all are experiencing some difficulties, some hard times, but we experience good times too. He goes on, verse 10, But may the God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect establish, strengthen you, and settle you to Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, what a wonderful thing here. Now, I wonder what Peter was thinking when he said this. So I, Now, this is me. This is not biblical. This is just my little simple mind. Uh, I call it my recliner time. I'm sitting there thinking, now Peter wrote about this roaring lion. I wonder if it's because Jesus said to Peter, Satan wanted to shift you. Like the shaft of the wheat. But, but, I prayed for you. Can you imagine Peter hearing them words? Saying, the devil wanted to take you but I prayed for you. You know what Jesus tells us today? The devil wanted you, but I died for you. I paid your price. You are free from this evil roaring lion. We got to stand firm. So let's look at the words here. Is he in our workplaces? I, I, and I, we all have different workplaces. Some of you say, well, I don't work. I, I just stay home all the time. That's your workplace. But, you know, I was thinking about the workplace, you know, how there's cutbacks and how there's downsizing and reductions, and then we come into COVID, and then we have uh, the days off because the government shut the, the days off, and then we come back, and, and then they restrictions and Blah, 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 blah. That's the world we live in. It just keeps dumping in on us. It's trying to smother us. But you know, the roar of Satan is heard through all this rumble. People are listening to the roar of the devil because he shows you the easy way out. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow my format. But you know me. When God tells me to break off, I break off. And, and if I break off, you won't know it because you haven't read my notes. So just go with me, okay? But you know, I remember a time we were talking at my other job. And, and it's so easy to start something that the devil can grab a hold of and run with. Let me give you an example. This group of people were talking and teasing each other, and they said, oh, there's going to be some great layoffs this summer. And they're not going to call these people back. That's all was said. And then they laughed, and they carried on, and they went on with their fellowship. And, and about an hour later, this one man said, I'm going to go tell my boss exactly what I think. Well, that's a good way to get fired right there. <laughs> But he says, if I'm going to get laid off, I know I'm going to get laid off. I know he's going to choose me. I'm just going to go tell him what I think. And finally, one of the other guys says, we better go tell him that we was just kidding. We was just joking. So they told him, and they all laughed, and he, he, he. But one month to the day, that man retired. And this group of people wondered if that joke had not caused him to go into retirement. Because you know, this is what that man probably heard. They're going to take my job. How am I going to feed my family? 
How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to survive? How am I going to be able to do anything without my job, without my money, without... And this man, this is what broke my heart most of all, was a child of God who knew God's promises. But the roar of Satan was so loud that he chose to choose it over God. Many people in our days have done that, especially in the days we're living in right now. So many people have professed to be Christians, but yet their lives are not reflecting that. We're not judging because God will judge. And when God judge, they're going to answer, not us. But the Bible does tell us if we see our brother walking away into sin, we should go and help bring him back in. And that's what we want to do. So this morning I want to talk about this lesson that we learned here as this joke. It's some people you can't tease with. Now I want you to stop a moment and think in your life. Is there someone that you know that you can't tease or laugh or joke with? They just take everything to heart. Well, that's the one I want you to pray for this week. Pray for them really hard. That God will give them the ability to stand firm and hear the roar of God versus the roar of Satan. You notice when, this is what I notice. This is so, I don't know, it's cool to me. Maybe you guys will think it's nothing, but I think it's absolutely wonderful. The Bible says that Satan goes around roaring trying to deceive somebody. You know, if he's roaring, he's not biting. Did you get that? He's not biting. You know what? If we listen to that roar, we'll bite ourselves. We'll bite right into sin. We'll, we'll, we'll tear our faith down all by ourselves. We'll give in, and we'll just keep going down and down. And, and I wrote some things, you know, we will rip our own lives apart. We will allow Satan to come in and do stuff we would never have thought of before. Believe me, today in these times, people are doing that. All through the scriptures, they tell us about the false prophets, the deceiving teachers. And I know that God has laid on my heart that we got to start building our Christian body back up and prepare them for these false prophets, these false teachers. Sometimes they even call them Antichrist with a small a, not meaning the Antichrist, but anybody that's against Christ. We have to be firm. The world is looking for something stable. See, they won't find normal no more, so I don't use that word no more. Because God said, every day is a blessing. We need to wake up every day thanking God for that day. You know, what does the roar of the lion mean in the jungle? I thought about this. Here's another recliner moment. When he roars in the jungle... Everyone knows he's the king. His roar is meant to strike fear in his enemies because when he's hungry, he don't want anybody messing with his food. And if you're his enemy, you're his food. That's in the jungle. His roar scares away anyone that will interfere with him. Because when he's devouring his prey, he wants to do it all by himself. His roar is simply meant to strike fear, terror in the hearts of every other creature that hears it. Now let me take that example and apply it to Satan. He does the exact same thing. The exact same thing. He roars trying to get us to be afraid. To think that all this stuff in this world is going to really happen to us. That we're going to have to follow uh, this one world religion, this one world thing. I don't know. But you know, I'm not worried about all that. You know why? Because Jesus said in his word, I'm going to come after you. 
I am going to go prepare a place. And when it's ready, I'm going to come and get you. That you will be where I am. That's pretty powerful words. But you know what? I keep thinking about this. The Bible says in Revelation that Jesus is going to, or God's going to tell the son to come and get his bride. We talked about that last week. Remember when God looks over to his son, he says, son, go get your bride. And he excitedly comes down and he gets all of us. And we're ready to go. We're excited. You know, we sung that song, uh, Mike sung that song, Would You Be Ready to Go? I kept thinking, how did he know what I was going to preach on? How did the songs that they sung try to tell us, is your name going to be on the roll when it's called up yonder? That's what we're talking about right here today, this morning. The core of the problem is Satan is out there in the world. He's deceiving the world. And he's gotten to the high people who's got authority that we thought was our leaders. And I pray to you this morning, the only leader you have is Jesus Christ. Maybe I see that again. The only leader we need to have is Jesus Christ. Because when we follow Him, we're going to the right place. I'm telling you, we have to live here. We have to follow the rules. We need to be obedient. We need to do what they tell us. We need to protect ourselves. We need to do what they're telling us for the good. But we need to get into the Word and make sure it's what God wants us to do. I read a story in Guideposts yesterday. This woman, uh, her husband became an alcoholic and he left her and he told her, I'm going to divorce her. They have a little girl. And uh, the coronavirus came in and, and uh, the, the mother said to the little girl, because she had to time off from her job, he says, honey, what do you want to do while we have this time? And she says, I want to see 67 waterfalls. <laughs> nice little kid. Wouldn't you love that? And her mom says, well, maybe we'll see five or six. But anyway, as the life goes on, in this time she's off, her husband, uh, she gets a text because she's on this trip. And uh, she gets a text, her husband signed the divorce papers. That's an answer to her prayer. That has taken the burden off of her. So the waterfall that she's now looking at is just perfect. But then her boss called back and said, oh, the government's going to make us stay off longer, but I've applied for this whatever is called, and, and we're going to keep paying you. And so she, okay, so she sees some more waterfalls and sees some more waterfalls. She calls her mother, and, and she joins them for a couple days, and they see some more waterfalls, and, and then she calls her friend, and they come. And the friend had got a divorce and, and had already walked the walk, and, and she said, my husband signed the divorce papers. Now what am I going to do? She heard the roar, not of the waterfalls, but of Satan, and said, how am I going to take care of my little girl? How can I do it all by myself? How, how, how? And her friend said, listen to me. Stop. You've been doing this all the time because your drunken husband hasn't done anything. God taught you how to do it. And then he gave you release papers and said, now you're free. So she went to some more waterfalls, and her boss called and said, well, we're just not going to be able to go back into service. We're just closing the doors. So she had more free time. And at the end of her time, when her unemployment was to go fill out her unemployment, she was amazed, and they took a picture. And I love this picture. It was not a beautiful waterfall. It was a waterfall. But what was so beautiful in this picture was this little girl held up a sign as 67th waterfall this year. Isn't God good? It depends on which roar you listen to. It depends. So let me get over here and talk about uh, in the marketplace. I thought about the marketplace. You know, in the Bible when it talks about marketplace, this is where everybody came. Not necessarily to buy every time, but to came. If you wanted to know something, you went to the marketplace. If you wanted to see what's going on, you went to the marketplace. Well, if you wanted to buy something, you went to the marketplace. But the key thing is, 
And there's some things that still, you know, in the marketplace today, I, I was reminded of, in Jerseyville, there's a place called Fran and Maryland's. It's a little country restaurant kitchen. And they have this great big round table. That's the marketplace. <laughs> you want to know anything in Jerseyville, you go to that marketplace, they'll tell you. <laughs> so we have marketplaces everywhere. Satan's in the midst of this. You know, um, I want to give you an example here. You remember where America and Soviet Union were in the grips of the Cold War. Some of you might not know that, but most of you will remember that. The people during that time started building bomb shelters, hoarding food, and doing all this stuff, putting in water, ammunition, uh, food products, and all this stuff. And then, you know what? It ended. But the bomb shelters remained. And guess what they're using today? That same fear tactic that they used during the Cold War against people today. And what are people doing today? Go try to buy toilet paper when they have a news article. Oh, you're going to be trapped in your house for two weeks. You won't buy toilet paper, bread, milk, cheese, any of those things. We'll clear them right off the shelf. We do the same thing today that they did back then. We didn't learn a lesson back then, I guess, because some of us, most of us are, 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 are reflecting back and we don't want to remember them times because that was a hard time. But you know what? Today's hard times. We need to strengthen each other. That's why the Bible tells us in Hebrews, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. It's not telling you to come and, and be with the Christian. It's telling you to come into the house of God, worship with these guys, encourage each other, lift each other up, love each other, and show the world we got it. Because Jesus has got our back. That's what we need to know today. The roaring lion is out there to strike the hearts when the storm comes and it starts to approach and when the terrorist comes, when the bomb strikes, when the homeland people, when, when we have riots and, and peaceful protests and we have people raging our capitals, when we have our, our own National Guard, our armies protecting against us, that's not in God's Word. Something is wrong. Satan is being listened to. He's preparing. You know, I study my Bible and I find that all the generation God is preparing the Antichrist for his time. I want to give you some good news when I talk about the Antichrist. He can't come until we leave. That's what the Bible says. The Antichrist will come after the rapture. But during the tribulation, you better watch out. So, I, you know, that's why I don't worry. Now, maybe I'm a little selfish. But when people say, well, we have to get the mark, we're going to have to do this, we have to do this, I'm going to be gone. The rapture will take me out of that. The only way I'm going through the rapture is because I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I asked for forgiveness and He said, you now are my brother or my sister. See, I'm a brother to Jesus because we have the same Father. His name is called Jehovah, God, the living God of all times. The Creator, the God who spoke this world, this universe, this massive place we live. The Bible says He made the heaven and the earth. And, and the Bible says that He will destroy this earth. This is not even in my notes. You're getting a free message here this morning. He's going to destroy this earth and give us something better. People say, well, I can't imagine God destroying this earth. Well, I want you to look up the history of Sodom and Gomorrah. No enemy attacked that city, or cities. But God, it said, rained hail and fire and brimstone down onto them communities. He destroyed them. 
And he gave warning. He says, why I'm taking out the evil, don't look because that evil is so bad. And Lot's wife just had to take a peek. And she turned into a pillar of salt. And I've always wondered why she turned into a pillar of salt. Because the ground where she was at was not salty. Now, this is me again, recliner time. Do you think that God was reminding us to be the salt of the world? They need to be thirsty for living water. They need to drink the living water of Jesus Christ. Will they thirst no more? Isn't that wonderful news? Oh, wonderful news. You know, the world tells us today to live it up for there's no tomorrow. We've got to go ahead and we've got to do what makes us happy. We've got to do all this stuff. Tomorrow may not be here. Well, they are correct. Tomorrow may not be here. But what is wrong is... They should be going to Jesus Christ and getting their life ready for Him instead of living it up, partying for the devil. Because do you know, and this is a horrible thing to wonder, people when they die, they take their last breath here and they will take their next breath either in heaven or hell. I know what the person in heaven kind of thinks. But I never thought about that person in hell when they wake up. I wonder if the first thing they say to themselves, hell is real. I should have listened. I don't know. Just take that and meditate it on this week. And if you know somebody that's lost, you might start praying for them a little harder. You might start praying for that lost person because I believe the time is coming that they're going to have to make a choice because when the trumpet is sound, it is done. The Bible says, here's another free message, the Bible says that if you were given the word of God before the rapture and you rejected God during the tribulation, you will not have another chance to become a child of God. Now, those that never heard the word of God and them was born during the tribulation, they will have a chance. But it's going to cost them, not what it costs you. All it costed you was to ask for forgiveness, to invite Jesus into your heart and to confess him with your mouth. That's all it costs you. But in tribulation, it's going to cost them their lives. But listen to me. Today is the day of salvation. That's the word of God. That's the message we need to carry today. So when you're thinking about the marketplace and the workplace, uh, in the doctor's office, what is it like when, when you, go to the, you, you go into the doctor's office? I'll never forget the words. The doctor looked at me and my wife and told her, you have cancer. Scared me a little bit. It looks like it's terminal. Now it petrified me. Because I got sucked up into that. I didn't believe my God could do all things at all times. We started praying, and guess what? 11 years later, she went to glory. But during them 11 years, she taught about Jesus. I shared with you before how she talked to this lady that had this inventive surgery that they had. She was going to die. She didn't do it. She was too afraid. She was listening to Satan. And she got out of her bed in the hospital after surgery herself, rode to the other side of the hospital with the permission of her doctor. Them two had a relationship that I was almost jealous of. Because whatever she said, he did. So she expected that as me. So I had to tell him, quit giving in to her all the time. He says, but I just love this lady because she is a miracle woman. I said, oh, I know, I've been blessed. But anyway, she rose over, she tells this lady, she talks to her. No one knows the conversation but her. And guess what? The lady has the surgery. And 10 years after that, I met that lady. She was cancer-free, and all three of her children know their mama. Now listen, God can do things. Listen, in the 11 years my wife had cancer, she's seen every one of her kids come to the Lord. 
all three of her sons accepted Jesus Christ. She's seen their, their baptism. She had a list. I want this. I want this. As I want this. I said, listen, you can't tell God what you want. She says, God told me. Write it down. I wrote it down. And everything on her list, she checked off. She wanted to see a grandchild. She got to hold not one, but two grandchildren. And this is not all about me, but I'm just telling you, if you listen to the right roar, what will happen? Now also she wanted things like uh, to go to her son's wedding. Well, she got to walk down the aisle one of her son's wedding. And one of her greatest fears was that she would never have to place another child in the grave. God took her before that happened. She experienced it once. But you know, she never gave up. She never blamed God in all of her time. Now let me tell you, her cancer was so bad at the end, they used to put tubes in her kidneys to drain the urine out, but the kidneys died and they pulled the tubes. And guess what? That tumor grew out that little hole and grew up on the back side of her back. And it was exposed to everything. And she didn't give up. She didn't take the pain pills. She says, Jesus has got this. Until she took her last breath, she believed God was in control. I believe today God is in control. Amen. I'm not worried about this. You don't need to worry about this. God has it. We just got to trust Him. You know, we need to thank God. I want to tell you, I talked about the roar of Satan too much. I want to tell you about another roar. How about the roar of Judah? The Lion of Judah. It says it's the Son of Jesus Christ. Now, the good news is, well, let me go with the bad news. Satan tells you you're no good. Satan tells you in church, I don't know why you're here. These are all a bunch of hypocrites. These people are only coming just to show off. Shall I keep going? Satan will go on and tell you, you're not worthy. You, you committed too many sins. You got a bad one you're hiding. You didn't tell God about everything. And he gets you going, and he might convince you to sin. And then if you do sin a little bit, you know what Satan does? He runs off to God and tattles. Your child, your chosen one, he just sinned. She just sinned. That's what he does. But praise God the Judah, uh, the Lion of Judah, who is Jesus Christ, who is now the advocate for us. When he comes to God saying, there's your, your child sinning, Jesus says, but that sin's washed in the blood of me. I paid for that sin. You don't get to claim that. He is free. He is free. Why are we so worried? Why are we so worried? Thank God the Holy Spirit knows the devil's tricks. See, I started thinking about this. There's no trick Satan can't cover that the Holy Spirit don't know about. There's nothing Satan can do because God really does say in His Word, greater is He that is in you than He is in the world. He said that for a purpose, for days like these days we live in. I want to just think for a moment. 1 John Chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus writes, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. That's what he asks us, try not to sin. And then he goes on and says, And if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. See, I, I, I take that on my note card. I remember that verse. Because sometimes I do fall. And God says, it's hard not to fall. Because everything's pouring into you everywhere you go. But remember, you have an advocate. His name is Jesus. He, he's my counselor. He knows that... The judge is God and he's coming in and the devil is, is making up all this stuff and Jesus is patiently... I said, how come you're not objecting? How come you're not objecting? He said, be quiet. I got this. 
Satan goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And finally, the judge says, okay. He says, what do you have to say for your, your client? And Jesus stand up. He said, I died on the cross for this one. I shed my blood for this one. I paid it in full. You know what God says? Case dismissed. Case dismissed. Praise God we don't have to worry about that. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 says, well first I want to lead you up to this. God has got John on Pappas the island and he's given him a vision of the coming of Jesus. The rapture and the second coming and the tribulation and all the things till the end of of the world. John is writing these things down. And it comes to a point where there's this little book that there has to be somebody faithful to open it. And John starts weeping. Weeping. Now when they're saying we, he's just not shedding tears. He's weeping. He's sad. He's hurt. Because there's no one in all of heaven and all of earth and all in hell that was worthy. Nobody was coming forward. And finally, the uh, angel says to him, And one of the elders said unto me, to John, Weep not, behold. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals therefore. Jesus was worthy to open the book. He was able to say, my children can go through this. The lion, the begotten child of God. And I want to tell you, you know what Jesus' greatest roar is? Now I want you to picture this. Satan is having a heyday. Jesus is about to get to crucified. And Satan is just running around just happy as a lark. I'm telling you, he's shouting and dancing. And they have false trials and they find Jesus guilty and they get up there and they say, what do you want me to do with him? You want me to flog him? So he flogs him, he brings him back and they release a Barnabas. And, and, and finally they say, what do you want me to do with him? And they yell, crucify him. You know who was yelling that? Satan. Satan through the people. Crucifying, crucifying, crucifying. So guess what they did? They crucified him. But don't you know that journey up Gagatha Hill, up to the cross where he was going, he had to carry that cross. And don't you know Satan was walking and nagging him all the way. See, I don't think the beatings that Jesus took was these hard things. It was the laughter of Satan. But Jesus held his tongue. Jesus didn't sin. Jesus allowed him to put him on the cross to drive the spikes into his hands and his feet, put a sign over his head, drop him down in the hole, and leave him hanging there to die as he gasped for breath. He, 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 he led a brother to the home, to the father. He said... The, uh, the um, thief, thank you, hanging on the cross and said, remember me in paradise. And what did Jesus say? Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Immediately. Now don't forget those words. Them are powerful words, but it gets better. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Satan's running loops around the cross laughing and he on and having a heyday. The demons are throwing a party. It's like uh, New Year's Eve and they're having... Rockets are having everything. And Jesus is taking his last breath, but he roars out something that I will never forget. He roars. It is finished. Listen to the roar of Jesus. It is finished. It is paid in full. And he bowed his head and went to the Father. And then he went to the grave and God rose him up and gave us victory over death. We should be excited today if we listen to the roar of the devil. And I'm going to wrap up here. So listen to me. Satan tells us he's got your back. He'll give you good advice. He'll lead you where you need to go. Don't trust him. Don't trust him. Anything that is evil, 
is of the devil. That's what the Bible says. Everything good comes from God. Now, can God take evil and make good? Yes, he does. Look at my life. Be aware that Jesus overpowers Satan. Overpowers him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Listen to this. Peter writes again. Now, Peter is encouraging them. He says, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Wow, that's pretty powerful. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. Oh, that's great. And some understand slowness, but instead He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done it will be laid there bare. That's Peter's warning to us today. you got to know Jesus Christ now. Now. It's that important. We need to wake up every day. And I want to share with you this little illustration. And I'm going to close with this. Each day the sun rises on the plains and begins to heat up the vast savannas of Africa. The gazelle awakes to remember that he must be running wherever he goes. He must be faster than the slowest gazelle and faster than the fastest lion. Or he will surely become the lion's dinner by the end of day. Every day as the sun rises on the plain and begins to heat up the vast savannas of Africa, the lion awakes to remember that he must be running wherever he goes. He must be faster than the slowest gazelle and faster than the fastest lion, or he will surely starve that day. Let us realize that we need to wake up every morning running to Jesus. To Jesus. Because we don't have to outrun anybody. Because the Bible says you don't have to be the fastest. You just have to get to the finish line. Everyone who crosses the finish line gets the same prize, the same reward. When you bow down in humbleness and ask Jesus into your heart, and you tell him that you believe he's the son of God. You believe that he died for you. You believe that God rose him from the dead. You believe he can forgive you of your sins. Ask him into your heart. He will come. And Jesus says immediately, you shall be saved. If you never said that, you better be able to outrun Satan because he's chasing you to hell. He's chasing you to hell. But God said, if you listen to the roar of Judah, by accepting Jesus, you can walk to the finish line. You just cross over and you'll get the crown that God has promised you. And all of your life will be so worthy of walking, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Yes, the world will be throwing in, but if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll make it. We'll make it. So I'm asking you this morning, I hope you get up every morning running, running to Jesus. Start with prayer. I don't care if you pray while you're getting ready, if you're showering, eating breakfast, take time to pray. Get into God's Word. Listen to what God has to tell you so He can get you prepared for your day and then go forward keeping your eyes on Jesus. The prize is not for the fastest, but it's for everyone who crosses the finish line. Never, never, never forget that. It's not for the Billy Grahams of the world. It is for them, but it's also for each and every one of us. The Bible says we get the same prize for crossing the line. We get an eternal life with Jesus Christ. 
we get to spend eternity with God. Now, as Susie comes, we're going to get prepared here. But I want you to stand right now. And I want you to have an opportunity to come to Jesus. As she's getting ready to do our last song for the day, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to come to Jesus. If you need to pray, if you need to do, come and get saved, if you need to be baptized, whatever, come to Jesus. Now, even while we're singing, is it, I'm part of the family of God, is that what we're singing? That's a great song, family of God. Come, I'm going to be here. I'll pray with you. wanted to give you an invitation to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, the Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. So I'm going to pray with you and ask you to pray with me. But the Bible says that if you pray meaning with your heart, that you could be saved. Today could be your day of salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We ask you now to forgive me me a sinner, and Lord, that you would take away all my sins. And Father, I pray that you will bless me, Father, and I ask that Jesus will become my Lord and Savior, come into my heart. I believe that he's your son, I believe he died for me, and I believe he rose from the grave, giving me victory over death. I thank you for this gift of eternal life, and I give my life to you. For I ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, if you pray that, I'm going to ask you to call our office at 618-462-9523. Or you can email me at nasbc2245 at outlook.com. I want you to know that Jesus loves you, and so do we. So please follow up with us as soon as possible so we can help you in your new walk in Jesus. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God.